I, I want to go back to the new members. Yeah. This is the only, I'm an old woman in my 70s, but this is the only place I go to where it's yeah, yeah. top heavy with seniors. Every other place I go to has more of a mixture of mm -hmm. 20, 30, 40 year olds. So I really think we need to do that. I've come to, I've only been a member one year and I don't come to all the functions, but I really do miss the different age groups. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people that I associate with give me good ideas that are a lot younger, mm -hmm. and they tell me they really appreciate my good ideas. Mm -hmm. so, so you're talking about, uh, as, you, as, as you think about, uh, I think, the comment is, as, as we think about membership, and we think particularly about who, who the membership should become, I'm, I'm repeating, I'm trying to encapsulate the comment. Uh, so as we think about what the membership should become, uh, you were asking for a membership that's more intergenerational. And you had the feeling that right now, uh, it's more senior citizen. So that's the comment. Thank you. Is the San Francisco Mechanics Institute in touch with the few other remaining mechanics institutes around the world? Uh, we are. Thanks to uh, the staff here, there's been good communication, particularly with the Australia Mechanics Institute. And um, there is some talk about uh, creating a gathering of the International uh, Mechanics Institute. So mm -hmm. we'll keep you apprised of how that conversation goes. Thanks. Ralph, can I say something about that, please? Please. I'm here kind of the library director, and actually we are part of the membership libraries group, which is a group of about 20 to 25. We've lost a few. We're trying to get them back of Athenaeans and other membership libraries and mechanics institutes in North America. And we meet, we email all the time. We meet once a year. And uh, so there is a vibrant group still going on of membership libraries. And then, as Ralph said, beyond the US as well. So um, I don't want to take too much more time. Uh, so if there's one more question or comment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, I just, we're, we're in a time now of, of uh, essentially digital libraries, electronic libraries, which gives the small library a good chance they're going to have to go up and spend some money on it, but a good chance to become, in effect, almost a research library. So much has been digitized. Mm -hmm. And it, I wonder if you've done any exploring <coughs> this towards, towards becoming, in a sense, a big library by use of electronics. Uh, so, so one could do serious research on mm -hmm. so that kind of thing. It seems to me that it might be a way to, to go forward to the kind of library. Yeah, that's absolutely, I don't think we'll ever abandon uh, the book, um, but I think that, uh, you know, we're, ser we're making serious efforts uh, to have subscriptions that will help with that kind of research. Uh, just the other day, I was talking with someone who's a science writer, and uh, she suggested some, uh, for her research, the kinds of uh, subscriptions that would help, and I know the library staff is seriously considering you know, which directions would be appropriate for this institution to go with that. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, well, without further ado, I, and before I introduce Taryn, I just want to say, uh, as part of being executive director, I want to be very open to conversation. So uh, feel free to come by my office. If you see me walking in the library or the chess room or in the building, grab me and tell me your thoughts, send me an email. Um, I invite that. Uh, I think it will only make the institution stronger. So um, now it's my pleasure to introduce Taryn Edwards. And you all uh, probably know Taryn from the library. She uh, has terrific energy. She's uh, in many ways our in-house historian, so smart. Um, she's the librarian and member relations and marketing specialist here. She's embarking on a biography of Andrew Smith Holliday, who you'll hear, I'm sure, a little bit more about in a few minutes. And uh, she lives in the East Bay with her husband, daughter, and two energetic dogs. Um, she's uh, been with the mechanics since 2007 and has a BA in anthropology from Cal State East Bay and a MLIS from San Jose State 
She's uh, born and raised in Oakland, so please join me in welcoming Taryn Edwards. here since 2007 that's seven years oh yeah sorry you know what I look like <laughs> um, first I wanted to say that if you hold on through this presentation you'll get some cake okay <laughs> the cake will be cut after and I promise this will be short and sweet uh, maybe maybe a little too short for my uh, taste but you can always ask me uh, if you have any questions can you hear me all right how about that no louder louder <laughs> My father always said I had a boom boom voice. <laughs> um, anyway, so about five years ago, I became fascinated with the history of the Mechanics Institute. And I, that coincided with the time when I started doing a lot of the Wednesday tours, a lot more than, um, than I had been before. And one thing I noticed is that a lot of the tourists would say that they'd never heard about us before. And I wondered why that was the case. The short answer, I think, is that 1906, the earthquake and fire, was completely devastating for us. Not only did we lose our library and everything in it, but we also lost our fair building uh, at Larkin and Grove, where the Bill Graham Civic Center is now. And that fair building held our fairs, but it also held virtually all the good times in the city. We were literally in the newspaper every day. That pavilion held circuses, horse races, boxing, bicycle matches, or bicycle races, um, dances, musical concerts. It was fun back then. Anyway, <laughs> somehow, over the next century, we came the city's best kept secret. And, sin and I want to change that, basically. And I really feel that understanding our past is, is crucial to help envision the coming decades. Not that we aren't doing very well now. We are, but I want to see us be in the newspaper every day. I hope there's still newspapers. <laughs> I still want to have some boxing matches. <laughs> anyway, we have had a thrilling history, and I'm not joking when I use that word thrilling at least to me, <laughs> um, but perhaps more exciting is its future. The decision to found a Mechanics Institute was made on December 11th, 1854, which means we're going to be 160 years old next week. So please come to the holiday party. I, don't, I won't sing happy birthday, but uh, <laughs> we certainly will raise a toast. Uh, mechanics institutes in general were the offspring of the Industrial Revolution. They were created with the objective of providing useful knowledge, useful education uh, to those for whom a traditional university uh, was impossible to attain. Uh, such a facility was greatly needed in Gold Rush, San Francisco. Let's look at some statistics, and I promise this is the only page with numbers on it. Um, in 1848, San Francisco had roughly 800 people, but by 52, the population had mushroomed to 34,000, with over 100,000 a year still coming. Can you imagine that? Most of them left the city to go elsewhere in the state and try their hand at mining. But the gold by 52 had gotten harder to find, and the city began to experience an influx of former miners returning to the city, often physically broken because mining was very hard, depressed, often with drinking problems, and most of them didn't have enough money to go back home or support themselves. So basically, we were Oh, I almost said a bad word. We were up the creek without a paddle. 
Um, but by 52, there was now a group of people that hoped to make their pile in a different way. They hoped to start businesses, start families, and make San Francisco their permanent home. But they were stymied by the city's lack of organization and lack of infrastructure. Meanwhile, the residents, like they still do, crave news from home, news from around the world, and books. It's hard to imagine the internet not being there, but it wasn't. <laughs> um, anyway, reading was one way you helped fill the evening hours. Uh, and mail and newspapers arrived on the same ships that brought the, brought the mail, uh, newspapers and books. Um, anyway, reading rooms started cropping up almost immediately. The earliest in San Francisco that I could find opened in 1849, in June, over a store. And the owners of that store had grand plans. They wanted to have files of all the principal newspapers, plenty of books, skewed towards the merchants uh, of the world, and also have a daily meeting where, mem where uh, merchants could get together and discuss business. Um, this was the city's first merchants exchange. And there was several more. This one in particular got blown up by the, uh, by the, by the fire, one of the fire departments at the time in order to prevent a fire from spreading. How's the sound going? Is this better? Okay, it's creeping down slowly. Um, some of these proto-libraries, as I call them, I call them that because they didn't tend to have a staff, they didn't have a system of organization, they didn't have all the things that um, come along with being a library today. Anyway, many of them were private social clubs, like the Leidesdorf Club uh, and the San Francisco Verine. Um, one was in a hotel, that was the Wet Cheer House, uh, and they were very expensive. The Clay Street Reading Room, for example, the one at the top of the list, cost $5 a month, which sounds very reasonable, but that is $111 in today's money. It, was, it cost a dollar a day uh, to use. Information back then, as it is still today, not free. Very expensive. Public libraries, publicly funded libraries, was, were virtually unknown in 1850 nationwide, and in fact, California wouldn't fund libraries via state taxes until 1878. This is the only time I'm going to mention Mr. Andrew Smith-Halliday because he wasn't involved with us in our first five years.